with me now in the Pateo Academia. If you look that up on uh, pateo.nl, go to Pateo Academia, click on it. Then you see also the name of Randy Powell on his website. The Akba, Akba Kingdom, Kingdom is there. And it's mostly about this beautiful symbol. I will not uh, discuss it into detail, but just I will show the doubling sequence. When we start at 1, when we double 1, then we arrive at 2. That's the straight line from 1 to 2. When we double 2, we go to 4. That's a straight line from 2 to 4. When we double 4, we get 8. That's a straight line from 4 to 8. When we double 8, we get 16. Now we have to look at the number of logical value of 16. And that's uh, we get that by adding up the 1 and the 6. And then we get 7. So that's the straight line from 8 to 7. The double of 16 is 32. And by adding up the 3 and the 2, we arrive at 5. And that's the straight line from 7 to 5. And then the straight line from 5 to 1 is in fact representing 64, because 6 plus 4 is 10, and 1 plus 0 is 1 again. And this goes into goes uh, on into infinity, or in infinitely. So that's the doubling sequence. When you go the other way around, it's the halving sequence. It's the same way. But it's important to notice that we were at this level, the level of uh, Sol, of uh, the level of uh, La, Lactea, and we now go to the level of Sol. We go from 3 to 6, and that is the doubling. And the doubling continues from here, because at the level of Sol we have the number 6, but then we double again, and then we arrive at 12 at the level of Fa, Fata, Fate, meaning the Zodiac. Then we double again, when we arrive at 24, and that's the level of our microcosm, Mother Terra. And then we arrive at 48, when we double 24 again. And that's the level of Regina, the moon Luna. And these numbers do have meaning. I will come back to that uh, later, but for instance, the Zodiac has 12 houses. That's where the 12 stands for. And a full uh, rotation of our home planet, Terra, around her own axis, takes 24 hours, so there is a 24, and within that period of 24 hours there are two full uh, diurnal tides, uh, two full tides, so it's a semi-diurnal tide, that means a doubling of the 24, arriving at 48. Okay, we arrive now at part 5. At least I hope so. Something is not going okay. Um Yeah, it's already time for a break. Something is wrong with the PowerPoint because it doesn't go to the next slide. I will see what's, what's wrong. Um, I suggest that we take a short break for, let's say, 10 minutes, and then we start again at 5 minutes before the next hour. So I hope to see you soon. I will play in the meantime a video uh, of myself explaining this in a little bit different words for the people who want to, uh, yeah, want to see it again. And I hope that when I come back, this PowerPoint slide is working good. Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope we all had a break and everybody's uh, back again. There are two questions on the chat I would like to answer. The first one is from Maurice. He asked if every bird actually is a star. Well, I hope that you mean that um, the reference in the Bible where, where they talk about birds. Of course, that is referring to a, a star or a star system because some lights we see are in fact clusters of stars or sometimes even clusters of galaxies but uh, it's all referring to the duality of light and darkness so the, the birds is referring to lights, lights we can see in the sky and the second question is about the dimensions 
Well, I'm not too keen about all the theories people have about the fourth and fifth and sixth dimensions. To me, I, I cannot make any sense of it. To me, there are only three dimensions. And when we look at space, this is uh, the breadth, height and depth. And when we look at time, this is daily time, daily time, and it is the great daily time. So both time and space have three dimensions. I, and I have no clue what a fourth or fifth dimension actually can be. To me, it doesn't make sense. Doesn't mean that there are, that there is more to this reality than than our senses can perceive. I fully, I think that that is true. But to call it dimensions, I think that's that's very um, that's that's not really helping us to understand it. So I don't like to use those words. I hope I, I uh, made my point clear. If not, please put it in the chat, and uh, my colleague Sven will uh, at the end bring it back to my attention again. Okay. Let us continue, move on to part 5 of uh, the science of creation, and that part is about music. The music, that's in fact the third way to understand the first part A, or approach to understand creation. The first one was geometry, the second one was numbers, and now the third one is music. To know a little bit more about this as a background, you can also go to uh, the pateo.nl website and then click on the video called Holy Science. It uh, consists of nine parts, and in those nine parts I explain much more than I will do now, but I hope that I'll, I'll be able to share the essence of it right here and now on this webinar. Let us go back to Plato first. Plato was lived in ancient Greece uh, a long time ago, about 2400 years ago. And to me, he was able to understand a lot of wisdom that we had in the period of Atlantis. And somehow he was able to uh, pass it on to us. But we, most of the people were not able to understand what he meant. What he meant. For instance, his most famous allegory of the cave is showing us the nature of our reality. At least that's how I understand it. What we perceive, what we can see with our senses, and, and including with our machinery, with our equipment, that is all relating to the shadow world. That is what we see on the wall. Those are the shadows on the wall. That's what most people call the reality. That's what most people call real. And, uh, but it's in fact not real by itself. It's an effect of something else. Like the shadows are created by the objects that are held in front of the fire. And those shadows, uh, those, those objects create the, wall, the shadows on the wall. And that is the same for our matter. Matter is created by the flow of energies, and the energies originate from the source, and that's the fire, and that's the, the information we can find in the fire. So everything is in fact information, and that information creates a flow, a flow of energy, and that flow of energy that's, that somehow projects the shadows on the wall, that creates what we call matter. So we have three worlds, the world of the manifestations, the world of emotions in front of that, and the world of meaning in front of that world. Three worlds. Another famous ancient Greek said, Pantarei, meaning everything flows. Nothing can stand still, because everything in the second world, the world of the energies, is not able to stand still. Everything is always moving. And because the energies are always moving, also the shadows of energies are moving, meaning the matter. So that's in, in an essence the meaning of the allegory of the cave, as I understand it. And it fully matches with what we said in the previous part, before the break. Because Do is the source world, and that's the world where everything originates from, the meaning world. And the flow world is the second world, that's the world of the yin and yang energies, flowing together, creating dynamics. That's the level of C. And the shadows we perceive crea are created by the trinity of yin and yang, and the yin, the, the yin, the third part in the middle. So that's the shadow world. So do, si, la is also the source world, the flow world, and the shadow world. Just as Plato tried to explain to us in the allegory of the cave. Now let us look at the dynamics of the energies, the movement of energies. We are not able to see the energies directly, we can only see the effects of energy. And those effects are creating a kind of sine waves. 
and the sine wave is representing both the uh, amount of energy as the speed of energy. The amplitude of the sine wave is showing how much energy is present and the wavelength is showing how fast energy is traveling. The shorter the wavelength, the faster the energy is traveling. But that's in fact a two-dimensional representation of, of uh, the movement of energy, or in fact the shadow movement. Uh, because when we look at it from the front, then we will see a circle. And that's the picture pic we see at the bottom left side. To have a, a more accurate 3D representation of this movement, then we get a spiral, and that's what we see at the right bottom side. So every wave we in fact see is in fact a spiral when we can see the full dynamics. The waves that were rolling onto the coast look like uh, a real wave, but it's in fact a spiral. The water is spiraling through that and causing the effect of a wave. Now let us look again at the two dimensional shapes, but now at the, the relations between them. Because on the top side of this slide we see two energies represented as a wave, so a two-dimensional shape. Uh, the upper one is going twice as fast as the lower one, and that's a harmonic relation. And the name of that harmonic relation is called an octave. And that's the relation we see between the first do and the last do of an octave. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, and the second do vibrates twice as fast as the first do. So it's a ratio of one versus two. And when we put those two waves on top of each each other, then we see that they have three mutual points, three share points, at the beginning, at the end, and half in the middle. Again, we have to understand that this is a three-dimensional shape, so not every crossing is in fact a, a real crossing in 3D. Yeah, the first and the last crossings, they look at the same, but they're not at the same spot. Only the, the marked one, the, the bulb dots, those are actually crossings through the zero point line, in three-dimensional shape. So that's an harmonic relation, because this, these, these dots will appear continuously when the vibrations keep the same. So an octave is a harmonic relation of music or vibration. A second one is the quint. That's what we see on this slide. And that's a relation between, of a ratio between 2 and 3. And again when we put those two vibrations on top of each other, we see three shared points beginning, in the middle, and at the end. So that's a harmonic relation of the quints, 2 versus 3. And the third one is called a chord, and that's a ratio of 3 versus 4. Again we see in the middle, at the beginning, and at the end, shared points in three-dimensional uh, shape, three-dimensional space. And when we put those three harmonic relations into one figure or to one shape, then we see this. When we go bowling, this is exactly what we see. We see first one, then two, then three, and then four. And the jump from one to two is the octave relation. The jump from two to three is the quint relation. And the jump from three to four, that's the chord relation. And when we add up all this, we get ten. So that's also a beautiful uh, harmony. Exactly ten. I think that's how our, our decimal system is based on ten. Here we see, here we see in the next slide, the um, octave of creation. Some people call it the enneagram. That's also possible, uh, but I prefer to call it an octave. Uh, and we need to understand that it goes counterclockwise when we look at creation, because it starts at the level of do, then it goes to si, then to la, then to sol, then to fa, then to mi, and finally to re. And it goes clockwise when we look at the stairway of ascension. Then it's re, mi, fa, sol, la, si all the way back to go. And the two triangles, they are very important. The white one with the, um, with the dark side and the dark one with the white side. So we could say the white triangle and the dark triangle, or the black dark triangle. The, one, the white one is pointed down and the black one is pointed up. And that's, it has a lot of meaning. Here we see the tones, but now we also see the frequencies within the range of 265 until 512. And when we look at these frequencies, then we find the La, which is the tone of A, uh, 
of A, sorry, so A, A, B, C of A. Uh, the tone A is 432 hertz, and that's that's the harmonic relation, a uh, harmonic uh, frequency, because when we have music where the A is on 432 hertz, then it resonates with our heart. Most of the music we hear, the A is on 440, which is hertz, 8 hertz too much, and it's a little bit off. It's very much off, uh, off tune with the natural frequency. So this is natural. This is based on the work of Pythagoras. Um, again, I will not go into much detail um, to explain everything, but the bows on the top side, those are the quint relations, and the bows on the bottom side, those are the quad relations. For instance, the relation from Do to Sol, with the bow on top, that's a quint, and the relation from Do to Fa, that's a quad relation. That's a bow on the bottom. Now look at the jumps between the frequencies. When we go from Do to Re, it's a big jump. It's a jump from 8 to 9. And again, from Re to Mi is also 8 to 9. Those are two big jumps. But the jump from Mi to Fa is a really small one. It's 243 to 256. And because that is more than twice smaller, there's no room for a semitone. Because the black keys on the keyboard, those are the semitones, and the white keys are the holy tones. So between Do and Re, there's a semitone, there's a black key, and between Re and Mi, there's also a black key, it's a semitone. But between Mi and Fa, there's not enough vibrational space for a semitone. So that's why the black key is lacking there. And that's why we need a kind of shock, and that is the white triangle pointed down. And at the end, we also see that between C and Do, there's not enough space again. That's also the small jump, more than twice smaller than the previous three. So again, we need a kind of shock, and that's the male shock. Uh, so that's in fact the essence of the music. Most people don't understand it. It's all about vibrational frequencies, vibrational harmonies. And when we add up the semitones and the holy tones, then we get eight because there are uh, sorry thirteen because there are eight holy tones and five semitones. And when we now make a sine wave out of that, then we see do and a semitone which is in the dark side which is under then Re, another semitone which is under, then Mi, then we see a shock, and the shock creates the next tone at the other side. So now Fa is in the dark, and the semitone is in the light part. Sol in the dark, semitone in the light, La in the dark, semitone in the light, C in the dark, and again we need a shock to go to the other side. Now we could say that the light parts are the yin parts, are the day parts, and the dark parts are the night parts, are the yang parts. And when we count now, count now, then we see that there are seven light parts, or day parts, and six black parts, or night parts, or yang. So creation is also seven days. These are also the seven days of creation. But most people don't see the six nights in between. It's very important to understand that it's in total. 13 tones or 13 phases of creation. And the ways the Mayan people count it is very simple. They just use one dot for one, two for two, three for three, four for four. And when we arrive at five, then we make a line. So we connect the four dots and create a line. And then we put another dot on top of that, meaning six, and so on. And two lines on top, meaning ten. And then, yeah, at the end we have two lines and three dots, meaning thirteen very important. When you look at the flag of Washington DC, just Google it, then you'll see that it's 13. And there are many more references on the one dollar bill to 13. I found at least 11 references to 13, so 13 is not a number of bad luck. 13 is the number of creation, as I said before. It's the seven days and the six nights. And it's also the seven stripes, red stripes and the, uh, the six white stripes in between on the flag of the United States of America. There are 13 stripes representing the 13 tones of creation. It has nothing to do with bad luck. So I hope that I made my point here. When we look at the harmonic relations between the tones, then we get this kind of symbol. looks a bit like the crucifix. I'll just show it to give some uh, impression. Now let's continue to the sixth part of this webinar. It's called the Gods of Creation. It starts at the level of God, the Holy, uh, the, the, the God, Lord God Almighty, the Creator of everything. 
But that level is higher than the level of the universe. And I have no picture of, of God that is higher or greater than the universe. Because, yeah, that's impossible. The Islam, it is forbidden to, to make a picture of God or Allah or whatever you like to call him. Uh, or her or whatever. Um, but it's it's very impossible because God, the Lord God Almighty, Go Dominus, is bigger than the universe, and I don't think we can make a picture that is bigger than the universe. So there's no picture of God here, the highest level, the highest creator, the, the Lord God Almighty. But we do have a picture of the level below that. And that is the picture of Si, Si Dera, all stars. And that is the known universe. Please note that the, the diameter of the known universe is 115 billion light years. Some people claim there was a, a Big Bang 13.7 million a billion light years ago. But it is really strange that the lights at the perimeter of the universe were able to travel 75 billion light years in only 13.7 light years time or years time. So either that light traveled or those, those stars, those planets traveled with a light, with a speed much higher, about five times higher than the speed of light, or the Big Bang Theory is not really sound. So that's really remarkable. To me, the God at this level of creation, the level of the known universe, the level of Sisibira, I call that God Tao. Tao to me is the ruler of our universe. And the symbol of that God is the symbol of yin and yang, the symbol of Tao. And that's what we see here. When we go to the level below the level that is ruled by, the, uh, by Tao, then we arrive at the level of the Milky Way. And the middle of the Milky Way, the central sun in the Milky Way, is called the Hunapku by the Mayans. And the Hunapku is in fact the God, the ruling God of our galaxy. And the symbol the Mayans use for Hunapku, you see at the top right corner. And with a little bit of imagination, you can see that that is in fact uh, looking like a kind of a star system, our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Then we go to the level below the Milky Way, and that's the level of our solar system, of the Sol, the Sun. And I, as I said before, the name I use for that level is this, the name of the central Sun called Helios. Helios is the ruler in our solar system. Another ancient name, it's an ancient Greek name of the sun Helios, is IHS. You have to pronounce it differently, but that will come later. But it looks like IHS, but remember that they are not our own letters, those are in fact Greek letters. When we go to a search engine on the internet and we search on images and we type in these letters, IHS, then this is what we get, for instance. These are uh, just uh, a collection of results. And all those ISSs are ref representing the sun. You can clearly see that by the, the rays of sunlight surrounding the word ISS in a circle. And also the cross is used a lot, and even the word Jesus. Because the correct pronunciation of IHS is Jes, or Yes. And when you make it longer, it becomes Jesus, or Jesus, or Jesus. It's all the same. So IHS or Jesus or Jess or Yes, that's an, an ancient name of the sun Helios. But there are many, many more. That's what we see on this line. When the, John, when the sun Helios was just above the horizon in the morning, Horus is in fact also referring to the horizon, the, the Horus sun. Horus sun meaning horizon. So it's Horus. That's the Horus name. When the sun was at the highest point, it was called Ra. I've said that before. Ra is the reference to the sun when it's high in the sky. And when the sun is setting, his name was Set in ancient Egypt. So both Horus, Ra and Set are references to the sun, but on a different position. Meaning just above the horizon in the morning, or at the highest point, or when it is setting on top of the horizon in the west sun. In the Sumeric society, the name of this central star in our own solar system is called Utu. Samesh in Babylonic culture, Surya in Sanskrit, and as I said before, Ahau is the Mayan, Mayan name for 
the son he was. IHS pronounced this Jesus or Yes or Yeses or whatever. That's, that's also a name. And he is the ruler in our own solar system. And the ruler uh, used to be the anointed one. Because there was a, a kind of homage brought to the, the ruler. And both the Christ and the Messiah mean the anointed one. So the son, Helios, is the anointed one. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the risen Savior, God's son, it's all a reference to the sun, the central sun in our uh, solar system, to Helios. So it is also the son of God. It is the sun with a U and with an O in the middle. It's the same. It's God's son. And it's also the father, the father we see in heaven. Because our mother planet, Terra, is our mother. But the sun is our, is our father. And we find our father in daytime in heaven. That's where we can find him. Our Father who art in heaven. It's a reference to the Son, who is. And what our Father is giving us is light. And that light bring, makes us whole again. When it's now spring, but most people uh, are very have uh, trouble with uh, fatigue in the in the spring because they have not enough have not enough sunlight in the winter. So we need vitamin D to become more whole again. So the light bring, makes us whole. That's why it's holy. And light is spirit. It's a fire energy. Spirit means fire. So the fire that is coming to us from the sun, that is in fact uh, the spirit. So the sun, Helios, is the sun, the father, and the Holy Spirit in one. He is the Holy Trinity. All the references in the Bible to the Holy Trinity, to Jesus Christ, to the Father, they all refer to the sun, the bringer of light, the risen Savior. Now let's move on to the next level. Because the ruler at the level of the planets, the biggest planet, that is in fact the planet Jupiter. Oh, I see that the presentation on the webinar is a little bit slow. Yeah, there it is. Um, we call it now Jupiter, but you can also disconnect Jew and Peter and then you get Jew Peter or you could say Saint Peter Saint Peter is in fact the same as Jupiter and Saint Peter Square in Vatican City is an homage to the planet of Jupiter the Vatican is honoring Jupiter not Jesus Christ not the Sun it is in fact honoring this very big planet and as I said before Jehovah is the Italian word, but when we Italian name for Jupiter, but when we pronounce it a little bit different, we get Jehovah. Jehovah in Italian and Jehovah, they are the same words. So the Jehovah Witnesses, they are witnesses of Jupiter, not of Jesus Christ. It's very important that they understand that. In ancient Europe, it was called this planet was called Tor. That's where the word Thursday comes from. Tor and Thur, they are the same or Wodan or Odin there are also names for the same planet Jupiter and in ancient Greek it was called Zeus and I also use the word Zeus to refer to this planet Zeus is the god at the level of Pan he is the ruler of the planets within our solar system because he's the biggest one then we arrive at the level of me the microcosm and the ruler at that level is our own mother Mother Terra Gaia meaning Mother Terra. So she is the ruler of the microcosm. I think most people are aware of that. And when we are not in connection with our mother, then we do horrible things. Then we arrive at the level of Re, Regina. And the Regina, the region at this level, is Luna, the moon. And she is in fact ruler of the underworld. She is ruling when there is darkness. When the sun is not present, then she looks, she, she pretends to be the sun because she's shining brightly and giving us a lot of light. But that's not her own light. That is the light that has been bounced back from her surface uh, to our own home planet. So she's the ruler of the underworld. And everybody who is at this level of consciousness, who is living at this level of, of uh, the lowest level 
of the seven worlds uh, is ruled by Luna and those people are lunatics. The people who are now trying to control this planet for a long, long time, those people are absolute lunatics. And everybody who allows those people to control you, to guide you, to tell you what is true and what is not true, those people are also lunatics. And in my experience, yeah, maybe 95% or even more of humanity at this moment are still lunatics because they have no clue about the true essence of everything. They have no clue about the meaning of holy science and how it can liberate you from the misguidance by the, the powers that, that try to deceive us. Here we see on the next slide the seven gods. The highest god is the Lord. I call it also God the God Omni. Omni means everything or the whole. That's the God of the wholeness. Then we have Tao, the God of duality, of uh, polarity. Then we have the God of Hunapku. Hunapku is the God of Trinity. Next we find Father Helios. That's our Father in heaven. And he is the God of the Hexa, of the Sixness. Zeus is the God of the Dozen, of the Twelveness. Mother Terra, Gaia, she is the goddess of the 24. And finally, at the bottom, we find Regent Luna. She is the goddess of the 48. And the question is, who of these gods is actually your own god? Who, who, who do you worship? Now let us look at the gods, the, the four gods at the bottom side. Because we cannot see Hunapku. Our scientists claim that Hunapku is a black hole. I don't believe in the concept of black hole. I've studied the work of the electric universe and then we see that the concept of black hole is science fiction. It has nothing to do with real science. But it is true we are not able to see Hunapku because there's too much light coming from the center and we cannot distinguish Hunapku from the other lights. Um, neither can we see Tao and of course we cannot see the Lord God Almighty. So the top three levels of gods we are not able to perceive, but the four at the bottom we do can perceive. And that's what we see on the next slide. The highest god we can perceive is Helios. And that's a plasma god, that's a fire god, because it's in fact a plasma energy. Helios is able to, to harvest the electric energy and to, to send that to us. So that's a gas, uh, sorry, that's a plasma planet. Plasma star, to be more correct. At the level of uh, Jupiter, we arrive at the, the energy of air, because Jupiter is a gas planet. And our home planet, Terra, is a water planet, it's a liquid planet. And Luna is a very solid planet, it's made of rock, it's an earth planet. So here we see the four basic energies earth, water, air, and fire in the correct order. And that's also corresponding to our own bodies, because we have a physical body, that's our earth body, that's our solid body. But we also have a liquid body, that is our astral body, that are the energies that we, uh, that, that we send out from our body. Uh, we can see that in the, in the rays of our of aura, for instance. We also have a mental body, created by our thoughts. And that's, we, can see, we can see that as a kind of gas that is surrounding us. And people can, can attach to that gas, to that mental energy. And the highest body we have is our light body. We saw it before. That's the Merkaba. That's the star tetrahedron. And that's in fact the own, our own light that we project into the world. That we emit, so to say. It's a little bit funny when we look at the, the diameters of these heavenly bodies. When we take the diameter of Luna as one, then we see that our home planet Terra is 7.3 times bigger, let's say 7 times bigger. Jupiter is 82 times bigger in diameter, and Helios is 800 times bigger. So that's it's uh, almost 8 times, uh, uh, 100 times as big as Jupiter. But the funny part is, when Luna is exactly in front of Helios, from our perspective, then they look exactly the same in diameter. So I think that is too coincidental to be coincidence. So really remarkable. So let us continue to the final part. The final part is about gods and idols. And um, in order to understand what an idol is, we need to understand what a god is. The highest god that we can perceive is the sun Helios. So Helios is in fact the representation of God in our 
our own visible reality. When we look at the sun, we in fact look at the God, at our own God, or the representation of God, at our own level, of our solar system. So the Christ is in fact God's son, Helios. And anti doesn't mean against, anti means instead of. The Antichrist is an idol instead of God's son. Some people are afraid of the Antichrist, some people think that the Antichrist will come into this world. Well, to me that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of BS, uh, because the Antichrist is already here. It's just every other planet that we put in the place of the sun. And by doing that, we create an idol. And that is the Antichrist. For instance, there is a lot of worshipping going on of the planet of Saturn. And his name is El or Eli, or also Il or Ilu. The elite is worshipping this planet, that's why they chose their name. Elite is, is uh, based on Eli, and also the Illuminati is based on the same, uh, same first word. It's Ilu, referring to the planet of Saturn, Kronos too. Um, and even the word Jaweh is related to Saturn. So when you think that Yahweh is God, then you in fact worship the Antichrist. You worship Saturn instead of God's son, instead of Helios. Elohim is mostly also uh, used for this planet, but in fact Elohim means in fact all the uh, heavenly bodies that surround us. So Elohim can also refer to all the other planets and even to the sun Helios. But mostly it's used for Saturn, Saturn family with the rings. And when we look at the top of the Saturn, let's say at the, at the North Pole of Saturn, uh, this picture has been taken of that North Pole. And it's an energy a movement. Uh, it's going counterclockwise. It's going inwards towards something black we see in the core. And with a little bit of imagination, you can see that it looks like a kind of a cube, a black cube. So a black cube is a representation for, uh, for Saturn. That's important. The black cube stands for Saturn. Now let us see where we can find those black cubes. For instance, here. When we go to Mecca, on the next slide. When we go to Mecca, we see nearly the same as on the previous picture. This is what we see on Saturn. And this is what we see in Mecca. It's a black cube in the middle, and we see a lot of worshippers around it in circles, exactly as we saw at the top, at the North Pole, so to say, of, uh, of Saturn. So they worship the Antichrist. They have no clue what they in fact do, but they worship the black cube, and the black cube stands for the Antichrist. Just as in the film uh, of Star Trek, the Borg is also the Antichrist. And when we look what, uh, what the religion, religious Jews, Orthodox Jews wear on their forehead, it's also a black cube, it's called a tefillin. And that black cube of course represents Saturn. Most people have no clue why they put that on their forehead, but it's, it's just a representation of Saturn. They worship the Antichrist instead of the Christ. They worship Saturn instead of the Son Helios. And the black cube, a cube has six faces. It's a three-dimensional shape. And Saturn is the sixth day of the week. And when we count from the middle, Saturn is also the sixth planet. So 666, it's the number of Saturn in this case, but the original number, we saw that before, 6 re referring to the Sun Helios. But now Saturn takes the number 6, so it is it's the Antichrist instead of the Christ. Also the hexagon, 6 sides, 2 dimensional shape. And the Seal of Solomon is now used to represent uh, Saturn. And when we look at the Seal of Solomon, we see 6 triangles uh, surrounding the hexagon in the middle and each triangle has three angles of 60, 60 degrees and numerologically that's also 666 
So it's very, very remarkable that all these sixes now refer to Saturn instead of Helios. And that's exactly what we see at the flag of Israel. I try to go to the next slide, but it's not really working. Yes, there is. Now we see the same symbol, the seal of Solomon, but now it's in black. Ah, uh, sorry, it's in blue. And blue means cold, while red means hot. So Christ, Helios, is the hottest planet in our, of the seven visible lights, while Saturn is the coldest one. That's why the color blue is used, to refer to the coldest one. So the blue seal of Solomon is a reference not to Helios, not to the Christ, but to Saturn, to the Antichrist. And to make it even more clear, there are two lines on top and below also in blue and that's in fact the Maya way of counting 11 but I will not go to that in detail so what we see is in fact Israel, the L is a reference to Saturn Is is a reference to Isis and Ra is a reference to the Sun Helios so it's in fact referring to three visible lights um, but the, the last one there is the emphasis on so the flag of Israel is in fact worshipping um, the Saturn planet, the planet of Saturn, the Antichrist. And here we see another shape of the Antichrist. Here we see the planet of Saturn in front of the Sun Helios. Or we could say it differently, Saturn is now sitting on the throne of light of Helios. Because there's a lot of light now surrounding uh, Saturn and the rings are lit beautifully. Uh, but it's not his own light. The light is from Helios, and Saturn is sitting on his throne. So that's what we see here. This is a picture of the Antichrist. And when we look from a distance to the same picture, then we see what we see here at the top. It's like an eye. It's like the all-seeing eye we find on the one dollar bill, uh, one of the dollar bill at the back side. And it was also present in ancient Egypt. The same symbol. That's the eye. But the eye is referring to the elite. The power of the elite. That's why they use the eye. Because they worship the Antichrist. This is a satanic culture. Satanic uh, uh, group. They worship not the real Christ. Not the Son Helios. But the Antichrist. Saturn. And that's why we see a lot of light surrounding it. Because here we see. Again at the bottom picture. We see um, Saturn on the throne of Helios, that's where the light is coming from and because Saturn is in front we cannot see Helios itself here we see the ancient symbol next slide, used in ancient Egypt it's the eye but it's also the, the shape of Physica Pisces and some people use the uh, word Jesus in the middle when will you do this then you are in fact not worshipping Jesus but you are in fact worshipping the Antichrist the people who use this symbol and put it on the back of the car, thinking that they are Christians, they have no clue what they really worship. They really worship the Antichrist. And here we see a picture of the Antichrist, to the left. Some people claim that this is Jesus, but please remember that Jesus was never a person on this planet. That story is, uh, is totally fictional. Jesus is the son Helios, and the son Helios has always been present in our solar system from the beginning so there was not a person around 2000 years ago with, with, with all the stories the stories of Jesus Christ in the Bible all are about the son Helios and here we see this antichrist with a ring around his head and the ring around his head is of course referring to the rings of Saturn the picture to the left is the person is Saturn it is the antichrist not the Christ and that is also why orthodox uh, Jews and Orthodox Muslims carry a long beard because the beard is representing to the rings of Saturn and they also wear rings on their heads and even the Pope is wearing the same symbol on his head 
So the, the Pope is in fact wearing, on the bottom right picture, is wearing a symbol that is coming from Islam. It's all, the, the, the thing on the heads, the rings, are referring to the rings of Saturn. It's worshipping of Saturn. And when we put things, rings around our finger, we do indeed worship Saturn. I don't say that people should not get married, but please re remember that the rings refer to Saturn. And if you put Saturn in the place of the sun, Helios, then you worship the Antichrist instead of the Christ. Now let us look at some flags from Muslim countries. These are flags of countries where most of the people are, uh, are Muslim. Uh, they believe in the Islam. And all of those flags have a moon, the shape of the moon Luna. And also the pentagram, the five-pointed star. What does this mean? Why they use five, five-pointed star, and why the moon? Next slide we see the moon Luna. And now we can understand that the Islamic calendar is in fact a lunar calendar. It's all based on the moon, the cycle of the moon. And Allah is not a reference to the God, to, to, to the highest God, the Lord God Almighty. Allah is a reference to the moon. Allah means the moon. And the Israeli uh, flight company, El Al, is referring to El, which is Saturn, and Al, which is the moon. So they worship two antichrists instead of the real Christ. Because the light of the night, the ruler of the underground, that is the moon instead of the sun. The sun that is uh, emitting or bouncing back the light that was emitted from the sun. So the moon is the antichrist. When we worship the moon and we, not worship, we do not worship the sun, then it's the antichrist. So that's what we see here. Now let us look at the five-pointed star and the meaning of five. Friday is the day that the, the Muslims have to go to the mosque. And Friday is of course the fifth day of the week. So that's the first reference to five. There are also five pillars of Islam. Five religious obligations. They are confession, prayer, fasting, alms and go to Mecca. At least once in a lifetime. And also every Muslim has to pray five times a day. It's all about five, five, five. So that's the reference to Venus. And now it's it's uh, Venus instead of the sun Helios. It's also a bright light in the sky. But it's not it's not Jesus Christ. It's an Antichrist. And the Ramadan is exactly one lunar cycle. It starts with a new moon and it ends with a new moon. So it's it's fully related to the moon. It's worshipping of the moon instead of the sun Helios. And when we look at the smallest planet in our own solar system, Mercury, I said before, in Sanskrit, that's the name Buddha. So if you think that Buddha was a person, then you have no clue. Because Buddha is in fact a planet. A small planet. The closest one to the sun Helios. And the same is true for Nabu and Hermes. And when you make a, a ring with your fingers by connecting your thumb and your uh, pointing finger, the index finger, sorry, um, then you also make a, a kind of ring. And that ring is of course a reference to Saturn. The official name of the city of Rome was Saturnia. So Rome was named after this planet, the planet with the rings. And also Brahma is, is a name for Saturn. So please understand that it's not about Jesus Christ, it's not about the risen Savior. It's all about planets instead of the real Christ. It's, it's all about Antichrist. So Rome is the city of the Antichrist. And in the city of the Antichrist, 